Another beautiful day. Thank you for the just the absolutely beautiful weather we've had the last several weeks, and we're just so grateful for that. Thankful now for this time we have to come and join together with the saints in the middle of the week and open your word and study your word and sing praises to you. And we pray that all things said and done here this evening are done in accordance with your will. Pray that as we leave here this evening to go to our homes. We will be strengthened and uplifted as we go into the second half of our week. And we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for your son. We're thankful for the promise of eternal life through your son, Jesus. If we do those things that you've commanded, pray that you'll be with all of our members here, those that are struggling Physically, spiritually, emotionally, pray that you'll be with them and pray that they will get the comfort and the healing that they need. I'm thankful for all those that we have prayed for in the past that are back with us. Pray that you'll continue to be with those of our members that have recently lost loved ones. You'll be with them and comfort them as only, as only you can be with our military first responders, be with the teachers of the hour this evening, that the things that they've studied and reviewed, they will bring those to remembrance and be able to present those in a way that will be uplifting and, and good, for, good for us all. Thankful for all you've done for us. Forgive us of those sins we've asked for, forgiveness of. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
All right. Written in highly symbolic language, we call that apocalyptic. I'll wait for him to get back there, turn it down. <laughs> I'm fired up. All right. Uh, it's about what will shortly take place, and then again, it's written to the seven churches of Asia to encourage them, and they're undergoing severe persecution at the time, and so uh, first and foremost, it was written for them, written to them for us, and we have to get the lessons from there and bring it to us rather than looking at it through our, our glasses. All right, now we're going to end chapter 18 tonight and hopefully begin chapter 19, although the slides may not go as far as where, where I'd like them to go, but we'll see when we get there. But in Revelation chapter 17, 18, and 19 kind of go together, and we've talked about this before, and they kind of, you know, what would normally be between the 6th and the 7th and the rotation, the cycles of the seals and the trumpets, uh, with the bowls of wrath being poured out, they just go from 6 to 7, and so this kind of, kind of the information that would go in between all that, because remember at, at number 7 of the bowls being poured out, that completed all of God's wrath upon Babylon, the harlot, the great city, however else she is described in Scripture. And so uh, this is kind of going back, filling that in. And so in chapter 17, talked about the harlot, uh, which again is the same figure, opposition against God. And then chapter 18 talks about Babylon, the great city, but again it's the same, same, thing, same meaning behind the figure. He's just giving it in two different ways. And then chapter 19, while that's going on here with Satan and the opposition uh, to God, there's some rejoicing going on in heaven. And so we'll get to that uh, in chapter 19. All right, so in verses uh, 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 20 and 21, let me read that. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more, and the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you any more, and the voice of a bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you any more. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. Uh, through verse 24. All right, and so he's kind of wrapping that up. Talked about all the things that, that happened with Babylon and all that, her merchants and all that. But now uh, we have uh, Babylon will, be vi will violently vanish. Will violently vanish. And, uh, of course, in, in that, you do have uh, some comparisons. Well, we'll look at some of the comparisons with other scriptures as well here in just a little bit. All right, but here a mighty angel comes down. And a uh, mighty angel, we've seen that. A strong angel, we've seen that before in uh, chapter uh, 5, verse 2, and chapter 10, verse 1. And so this angel uh, was seen as if it, it took up a stone as if it were a millstone and cast it into the sea. And I didn't realize all this, but there's actually, well, the word millstone is not a common word in the New Testament, although it does occur a few times. Uh, this, this word for millstone is only here, only in this particular uh, chapter. But a few verses later, there's another millstone that's mentioned that we do find elsewhere in Scripture. Um, but the millstone here referred to a, a, a millstone, just a millstone. And a millstone is a big old huge stone. Well, actually, they came in different sizes, okay? Uh, they did have, you know, I kind of compare it to a coffee maker, kind of, sort of, that when people would travel, uh, there was a millstone that was like this, about this size, and a millstone was a round stone, like a big, big stone, thick, had a hole, like a donut hole, but not quite that big, and you would put your grain underneath it, and then you, you know, the handheld kind, you would just turn it, and it would grind the grain, and you'd separate it from the chaff, okay? And so they would take that with them when they traveled so they could make bread and all that stuff on the way, then they had bigger ones that, that took men to turn. Then they had big old huge ones. And uh, I've seen some of these replicated, I guess, at the, uh, what do they call that place? Eureka Springs, Arkansas, you know. They have this Bible land out there where you have New Testament land. And you have the Old Testament land. as little trams that take you around, drop you off every 15 minutes, pick you up and all that. If you're ever out there, that's a good thing. They're famous for the Passion Play. I don't know if they do that every year or just in the spring. 
I don't know anymore. But anyway, I was out there several years ago. Was it? No, it's in Eureka Springs, it's called. Eureka Springs, Arkansas, yeah. And, uh, but if you ever get a chance to go out there, and I think it's probably, I don't know how far it is from Branson, but I don't know. It was about an hour and a half where I stayed one time, but anyway, it wasn't Branson, but anyway. Uh, it's a good, good thing. They have, you know, scale model of the tabernacle. They have to, shows you what a vineyard looks like, a wine press, and all that kind of stuff. And they have these millstones out here. But these millstones, some of them were big, where they would attach donkeys to it. We'll see a reference to that in a few verses, and it took animals to turn them. But again, the whole principle is the same. They would grind the grain, separate it from the chaff, where they could use, use the grain. All right, but this, this millstone was cast, or the King James says through, the old King James says cast, uh, into the sea. And uh, notice it also uh, with violence. Uh, and of course, never to be found again, but with violence. And that word violence there, with violence, is, it kind of depicts the suddenness of it, uh, the rushing of it, the, the quickness of it. The old ASV 1901 says, with a mighty fall, with a mighty fall. And the picture, uh, one commentator said, is like a, a, a millstone whizzing through the air. And uh, it says it just does, doesn't just fall into the sea, but it's violently slung. And again, that stresses the sudden and spectacular judgment of God that will be executed. And if you think about, you know, well, you know, maybe with the exception of, in fact, I do have a millstone at the house somewhere. Yeah, I should have found it when I was cleaning up from the water heater blowing up, but I didn't. So maybe someone took it. I don't know. But it's about this big, and I forgot where I got it, but I got one. Yeah, I should have brought it. But anyway, I can't find it, though. All right, but anyway. But, but if you think about, you know, the millstone that's like that or the millstone that takes the animals, just picking up and slinging it into the sea uh, would be imp a pretty impressive sight. But it is a strong angel here that's doing this. And then uh, he says, it will not be found anymore. Will not be found anymore. And a couple Old Testament passages here. Look in Ezekiel chapter 26. And we've looked at some of these passages in the past, emphasizing certain aspects. Uh, and so they're the same verse, but we're emphasizing different things from it because these passages are very similar to Revelation in that they're depicting the fall of Tyre or even sometimes Babylon and uh, showing how there's, there's a lot of parallels to that in here. And again, as I mentioned, in this apocalyptic uh, type language, you know, some of the symbols may be difficult for us to understand, although I'm confident the first readers knew about them. And if not, they had inspired teachers that would tell them that. But, um, you know, we do have the cheat sheet, as I sometimes say in the Old Testament, that if you kind of see what it looks like in the Old Testament, then you can get, get, kind of get a better handle of it in the New Testament. But in Ezekiel 26, 21, I will make you a terror. And uh, I believe he's talking to the city of Tyre. Yeah, if you go up to verse 15, thus says the Lord God to Tyre. Uh, but he does say, I will make you a terror, and you shall be no more. Though you are sought for, you will never be found again, says the Lord. And there's a really cool history about Tyre that we talked about earlier, but... It, it, you know, their, destruct, their total annihilation was in different stages that took uh, several years to accomplish. But guess what? You can't find Tyre anymore today. Uh, you can't find Tyre. You know about, about where it was, but you can't find it anymore because it does not exist because God's word is true. And then Jeremiah 51, at the very close of Jeremiah, and uh, chapters 51 and 52 are kind of a conclusion, and 52 especially, but... In chapter 51, verse 61, and here he is talking about Babylon. He says, and Jeremiah said to Sarah, when you arrive in Babylon and see it and read all these words, then you shall say, O Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off so that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. Now it shall be when you have finished reading this book, that you shall tie a stone to it and throw it into the Euphrates. Then you shall say, Thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon her, and they shall weary, uh, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. And so you have the same language in there, throw it into the stone and all that. And um, let's see, I know David was in the Navy. Anybody else in the Navy? I know Bob Pratt was in the Navy. Uh, but, you, you know, if you've ever been on those ships, you know, I worked on the Gulf of Mexico for about five years. 
diving and all that, and there's a lot of stuff that, you know, Davy Jones locker, it goes overboard, especially if you're in, you know, 400 feet of water, you're not seeing it again, and probably, unless it's around a structure where there's a lot of people, probably no one's ever going to see that again. And you think, how much stuff is in the ocean that we don't even know about, that will never be found? Yeah, Jimmy Hoffa, <laughs> all them guys, no, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, some stuff cool, some stuff mundane or whatever, but all that stuff in there, and uh, never to be found again. And, of course, we, even with all our sophisticated tools and all that stuff, still won't be found, and that's, that's what's going to happen here with Babylon. Now, again, of course, as we've been mentioning, Babylon is not the literal Babylon because passages like that, but it is figurative, uh, showing that, um, you know, the opposition, the capital city of opposition against God, if you will, is going to be taken care of and thrown out of the way, okay? And so, and of course, Babylon, you don't find Babylon anymore today, all right? And then the next section here, Babylon's once bustling activity will cease. And if you see here uh, in verse 22, the sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard anymore. So this list of musicians and music would be played usually at happy times. And so, in fact, in fact, all of these, um, well, all of these things that shall not be that he lists in 22 and 23 are things that are associated with happiness and, you know, greatness and all this kind of stuff, satisfaction and all that. And so the musicians indicating happy times will be gone. And he lists harpers, which are mentioned, again, only in Revelation here and in chapter 14 too. Musicians, and the ASV of 1901 calls this minstrels, and these would be the guys who would perform at the king's court and all of that. And um, musician that's only found here in this verse in all the New Testament. Flutists, uh, the King James calls harpers, or no, pipers. And ESV says flute players. And uh, it's only found once in Matthew 9.23, and then here. And then um, the trumpeters uh, is found only here in the, in at least this Greek word for trumpeters, is found only here in this verse right here. But the, again, playing of music would be, especially these instruments, would be associated with happy times, you know, partying and all that kind of stuff. All right, also notice the craftsmen next in uh, verse 22 no craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And each of these, you know, shall not be found in you anymore. In other words, it's gone. It's not coming back. It's not like during COVID. It just went under for a little bit. Of course, some stuff has gone forevermore too from COVID, but anyway. Um, but the craftsmen here indicate growth and expansion. In fact, right now, you know, Florida's booming. And so construction workers, I mean, I'm sure they, well, in fact, we know. <laughs> There's not enough of them to go around, okay? Uh, here we are in the middle of April. Supposed to be done in January. Man. Anyway, so there, but construction, you know, when, when things are booming, you need workers and craftsmen and all that, but there's not going to be that anymore, so they won't be found anymore. Verse 23, the light of, of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. In the light of a lamp, uh, and really lamps in... Uh, first century Greco-Roman world here were mainly only used for nighttime activity and really festivities type, type things, and unless, of course, you're, you know, in a room or something, whatever, but, um, you know, and, of course, some of the commentators would go into, you know, and, of course, we've heard about this before, that Nero would actually take Christian bodies and impale them and light them on fire to light up the lamps of the parties in his palaces and, and grounds and such. But um, these would be festive occasions that are not going to be found anymore. Uh, and so there'd be no, re there'd be no festive occasions anymore. And then um, the last one here, and the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. And bridegroom and bride, a voice of a bridegroom and bride, this is extreme or tremendous joy will be gone forever. And, uh, you know, the, the um, voice of a bridegroom and bride, not only is the occasion joyous, but when, hus you know, husband and wife come together in marriage, you know there's going to be offspring, at least generally speaking, 
And so there's going to be the perpetuation of the generations through marriage, okay? And uh, so, but all that's going to be gone, and it's not going to be around anymore, okay? Because Babylon is going to be gone, sinking down. And then uh, in verse 24, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all those who were slain on the earth, okay? And so and that's kind of a summary reason why she is going to fall, all right? Now, of course, you have uh, slain, in her was slain, and so you have, oh yeah, let me change here, um, Babylon sorcery deceived and slew her clients, and we talked about that before, of course, and the reason why we have that because you have merchants, you know, being, being mentioned right, right off the bat, and we talked about in the past that just like in our country, we have all these alliances with these countries, you know, you, you help us do this, we'll give you this, and vice versa and all that, but then the alliances, you know, grow cold or they get hostile, then all of a sudden we're enemies again, and the damage has already been done and all that. Well, in this case, the damage is beyond repair because this Babylon is going to be no more. So all those who profited from her are going to lose everything, and that was earlier in chapter 18, and so, uh, so forth. But there's two groups here. Her merchants, well, actually, her merchants were exalted uh, here. Well, actually, uh, yeah, her merchants were exalted. It says right off the bat, yeah, well, actually, no, in her was found the blood of prophets and saints. All right, and so the blood of them, and that's really the idea of blood guilt, you know, that they, Babylon had murdered them, killed them, persecuted them to death, and notice uh, there's two categories, if you will, that are mentioned here, the blood of prophets and saints, all right, so all true prophets are saints, but not all saints are prophets, but a prophet is a mouthpiece of God, and this, I think, is best illustrated by Aaron, you know, Aaron, uh, when Moses was before the I am, you know, who shall, I, you know, I, I can't speak, I'm not eloquent, and God promised him, this is in Exodus chapters 3 and 4, God promised him that Aaron would be his mouthpiece, and then in chapter 7, verse 1, uh, the Bible says, your prophet Aaron, talking to Moses, your prophet Aaron, and uh, so Aaron was his mouthpiece, and that's what a good definition of a prophet is. And so God's prophets are his mouthpieces. And so the messengers really are the lightning rod for persecution in a situation like this because they're the, you know, you, we've heard it, you know, shoot down the messenger. You know, um, they, they shoot down the messenger instead of the message because the message is true and it exposes them, all right? But uh, so he killed the prophets and the saints. And, of course, saints, by the way, we've talked about this before, but just a reminder the word saints is from the word holy, made plural, hagioi, okay, the saints, the holies, okay. There's only about one or two places where that, that, that word is translated holies, like in Hebrews when it talks about the holy of holies, that's it right there. I think twice in Hebrews, maybe one other time, but I don't even think, I, I can only think of twice in Hebrews, but every other time it's the word saints, and saints are holy ones. They're set apart by God. Uh, they're not like the denominations, you know, we've got to do this and do that, then we'll make you a saint, unless you're Mother Teresa, then you can be overnight, you know, whatever. But uh, that's just a bunch of religious foolishness there. But the Bible calls saints, and they're Christians. Saints are Christians. So you have disciples. Yeah, I guess saints would be the number one term that they're called, probably number-wise, maybe disciples. I'll have to take a look at that. I never thought about that before. But saints, disciples, and then Christians is only three times Oh, yeah, let me tell you this, too. <laughs> this I did check out. If you put in your concordance believers, plural believers, it's only going to come up twice. In, in, I don't know if that's King James or New King James. Now, you may have those who believe, but when you put in there believers, it only comes up twice, I think in the book of Acts or something. Uh, but yet, I almost, I almost hear, I hear believers a lot more from preachers these days than Christians or even disciples. And I don't know if that's a reflection of studying behind denominational people or what, but I don't know. I just found that interesting. But I did put it in the concordance one time, believers, plural, and it only comes up twice in the New Testament. So anyway, be that as it may. But anyway, you have believers, I know, is down, is, is less than Christians. Okay, Christians is three times. 
Uh, but I'm not sure between saints and disciples. I would guess saints is more, but I'll check it out one day, uh, than disciples. And, uh, of course, you know, the, um, well, the disciples of Christ, now it's a denomination, um, you know, once disciples of Christ and Christians were used interchangeably in, in, in the church until the split, which is a whole other lesson there, but, it's, well, I actually touched on it some, uh, last Sunday night, you know, binding what God has loosed or loosing what God has bound, all that's involved in that stuff. But anyway, um, you know, um, binding what God has loosed, but, you know, the church uh, disciples, and so we had a guy one time several years ago asked, you know, he asked me, oh, yeah, that's about the time between Brother McAnally and Hiram when I was preaching a lot, and he says, well, why do you say Christian so much when disciples you know, is, is more common in the New Testament. I thought, well, that's a good point. So anyway, I still say Christians more because <laughs> it's more precise, I think, and disciple, you know, anyway. But anyway, that's the word saints, all right? Now, uh, and so notice you have found, or in you was found the blood of prophets and saints uh, and of all who were slain on the earth, all right? So and of all who were slain on the earth seems uh, that would include uh, others being killed, which, you know, in these alliances and stuff, yeah, you just think about alliances between Muslims, you know, Muslim nations and Muslim nations. They believe kind of pretty much basically the same thing religiously, but do they sometimes not turn on one another, okay? And so if you have pagans and pagans with alliances and pagans turn upon pagans for the same reasons that the pagans turn upon Christians, or at least similar reasons sometimes, then you have persecution of others as well in the same policies, well, some of the same general policies, and so you have a lot of that going on. Go ahead, Bobby. About Muslim nations turning on each other, uh, they have Sharia law and they have Sunni law, and they probably have all kinds of other quote-unquote yeah. denominations within the mm -hmm. Muslim religion, mm -hmm. but the Sharia and the Sunni or the yeah. two biggest ones, the Sharia yes. and the Sunni don't get along. No, but even if you take Sharia and Sharia, they're going to turn on one another eventually. Yeah. Uh, whether it's over land or whatever, or you know whether it's going to be you know differences and stuff like that. Just like well, I don't know. You know, you think about when Roman Catholicism, you know, the golden age of the Catholic Church was the dark ages for everybody else. You know, and so um, you know they would go over there and kill Muslims. Yeah, for the same reason they would kill Muslims that they would kill people who claim to follow Christ but didn't follow what they thought they should do, you know, for, for the same reason. And so that's the kind of thing here. But, but it does seem like it's two groups. Of course, you know, the word and, which is chi, you know, you two guys on the ends, which can mean and or it can mean even or even as or something like that. But it seems like there's two groups being, being pointed out here. Uh, and, of course, persecuting God's people. Really, we've seen that throughout the book of Revelation. And so we won't go into much of that, but chapter 6, 9 through 11, that fifth seal, the souls of them who are under the altar who were slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of other passages like that as well. All right, uh, new section here in chapter 19. And so I uh, don't have a whole lot of slides on this, but I have that. I have a lot of notes, just never had time to put them on slides here. All right, but in chapter 19, uh, we have a... <clears throat> kind of a pleasant change since the last two chapters, which is about the last two months in my class. I don't know. All right, but anyway. Uh, and so in chapter 19, well, let, let me read the first uh, five verses here, actually the first four verses. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came, let me go ahead and read through verse 10 actually. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. 
And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell, as it, uh, fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do, it, do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right, but I want to read that whole section because of all the hallelujahs in there. All right, now, unfortunately, it's not here, but I do have it in my notes here. Um, I don't even know if you could even see my notes, but let's see. Uh, yeah, right there. All right. Whoa. Oh, yeah, I might make that bigger. Let's see. There, I can scroll around a little bit. All right, uh, but Revelation 17 through 19 are part of the same section. But Revelation 17 and 18, there's the fall of Babylon, the great city. And then in chapter 19, while 17 and 18 is going on, there's seen what's up in heaven, going on in heaven. And really, that's found throughout uh, the book of Revelation, though not to this extent, although, you know, we haven't had the two chapters of the fall of ba the harlot and the Babylon, and then one chapter with this, and so proportionally, it's about the same. Uh, remember, at the end of the sixth seal, you know, who's able, to, who's able to stand, and then you go into chapter seven, and you have the 144,000 sealed, and then you have the multitude, which no man could number, but all that stuff is like the silver lining for the saints, silver lining in the, crowd, in the cloud, and so also is this section here in chapter 19. All right, now you do have the um, glory in 1 through 7. John depicts a scene where the heavenly host sings hymns of jubilation featuring praiseworthy themes, and we'll look at all these themes in more detail. But notice the Lord our God... Um, is do all glory, honor, and power. Notice in verse uh, 1. Yeah, actually, notice, well, we're going to come back to the hallelujahs, but this is the only chapter in all the New Testament where hallelujah is found, okay? And hallelujah here is transliterated from a Hebrew into Greek, and it occurs a bunch of times in the book of Psalms, I think 24 times. But only in the book of Psalms and in Revelation is the word hallelujah found. But in our song books, there's a lot of songs that have hallelujah in them, okay, uh, which is pretty cool. And uh, hallelujah, um, hallelul, yeah, hallelul, whatever, uh, in Hebrew means praise. And then Yah is an abbreviated form of Jehovah or Yahweh. That's why some, well, I don't know. So it seems like some spellings of hallelujah have a J in it. Some spellings just have the U in it. Lou, yeah, I don't know. But I'm not good at spelling, so don't take my word on that. I know in the New King James, it's, it starts with the letter A, which in the Greek text, it starts with an alpha, but it has a rough breathing mark, which gives it a, an H sound, a ha, all right? But uh, it's an awesome word. And in the Psalms, I tried to find hallelujah in the Psalms, but it's not translated hallelujah in the New King James or the King James. It's translated praise the Lord. Go ahead, Bobby. Hallelujah and hallelujah is the same thing. Yes. But hallelujah starts with an A. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah starts with an H. Mm -hmm. If it's hallelujah, it's got an I where the J would be and the J. Okay. So it, that, that's the difference. In the, in the early uh, translations, yeah. I think you've told this before, there was no yeah. J in there. Yeah, there's no J sound. In there the was no J in the right. American alphabet up until couple of hundred years ago or is something. Is that right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, sure does. Because all the J words in the New Testament, like Jesus 
um, John, James, well, James is different, but they all have, like, Spanish. Spanish is I, or no, Spanish is Jesus, which, you know, if you spell it out like it sounds in American, it starts with an H. <laughs> but you, and I remember one time, Bobby, <laughs> he, uh, he was emailing Jesus, our missionary. And, uh, but he says in there, Jesus this, Jesus that. And I'm like, what, is he talking about some nuts that's claiming to be Jesus or something? But then as I read down a little bit, it talked about Honduras. Like, oh, that's Jesus, you know. Yeah. But, but it just looks like Jesus, you know. But in, in Spanish, it's pronounced Jesus. And there's no J in that, Jesus. But in Greek, all those J, well, most of those J's have a iota in front of them. So it's I Jesus. So in Greek, it's Jesus, but with an E sound in front of it. I Jesus. I Jesus. And uh, I Aonon is John. I Aonon. It's John. It starts with a uh, iota, or you know, looks like a letter I, but it's an iota. All right. But anyway, so hallelujah is a pretty, pretty awesome word, uh, and it's just a transliteration in from Hebrew into Greek, and then we transliterate it from either Hebrew or Greek into English, and that's why you have the different spellings. Okay. All right. Uh, but in verse 19, uh, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying. So here he just says a great multitude, but down um, in verse, uh, he talked about the, 20, the uh, 24 elders and all that. Let's see, where was that? It's right in front of me, I know, because I just read it. Um, four, yeah, four, there it is. The 24 elders, four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sat on the throne saying, Amen. And so that great multitude could be more than, just, than the 24 elders and four living creatures, but we know for sure it includes them, but I would probably say it included them and others, maybe the whole throne scene, you know, around the throne scene perhaps, but either way, they are praising out, saying, Lord, uh, hallelujah, praise God, in other words, praise God, salvation and glory and honor and power. Uh, salvation, oh yeah, so I left out salvation up there, I need to put that in, salvation, glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God, all right? Now notice the Lord, our God. He's our God because this is a great multitude from heaven saying this, and we are on God's side, and so we are on the same team as heaven. Uh, for true and righteous are his judgments, and so he is praiseworthy, number two, because he judges according to truth and justice. True and righteous or just are his judgments, Notice also, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, so he avenges the blood, or actually the next one, he avenged the blood, or he avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Now again, the harlot was mentioned particularly in chapter 17, but she's mentioned again too. Oh yeah, man. Well, where is this? It's up, well, somewhere. I don't know. Anyway, but if you compare, well, oh yeah, we haven't got to it yet, that's why, all right. Anyway, so the, I'm talking about the marriage supper of the lamb, the wife of the lamb, and it's pretty interesting that the word wife uh, and the word bride are two different Greek words, okay? Um, but the wife of the lamb, if you notice her, just while we're talking about the harlot here, the wife of the lamb... Um, Verse 7, his wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine. And think about what she's arrayed in compared to that harlot, 17.6. She's arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now the harlot has got all that jewelry on, all that makeup on, and all that kind of fake stuff on to attract, but she's empty, she's dead, she's, she's a goner, but the wife of the, the, the lamb, she's in fine linen, clean and bright. The total opposite of what that harlot is. All right, also the Lord God in verse 3, again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And so he is praised because he eternally condemns opposition to him. And uh, the harlot, the imagery of the harlot is still carried through here with the word her. But again, she, like the city, like Babylon, represents opposition against God. And there, perhaps, the infidelity against God's covenant is what's being, being emphasized, but she is the epitome of that. 
And then in the middle of verse 3, well, actually verse 6, well, we have verse 3. Um, oh, yeah, then 24 elders and four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne. Okay, it's okay to worship God, but in verses 10, John fell down to worship him, the angel. No, 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 sir, no, ma'am. Angels, angels are not worthy to be worshiped, only God. All right? Uh, who sat on the throne, their voice came from the throne saying, praise God, praise our God. Now praise our God in verse 5, that's what hallelujah means. But now I haven't gotten that far to see if that's the word hallelujah, but I'll have to look at that, but that's what it means. And when you look in, in the book of Psalms, actually notice praise the Lord is what hallelujah means. Uh, Yah is more Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, Elohim is God, so I have to look at that, but, but it means the same thing, praise our God. All you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And then I heard the other, other one here, uh, hallelujah, at the end of verse 6. Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And so he reigns. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. And that's, that's, that's loaded in a good way. Uh, yeah, so here's the word omnipotent. Omni means all-powerful. Does anyone have a translation that says all-powerful in there? Uh, verse, verse 6 at the end, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And uh, anyway, so there are some big words in the Bible sometimes, and you know, I hear a lot of people say sometimes, well, you know, my, so, my granddaddy, he was only a sixth grade education, which you know what, I did learn way back in the day, sixth grade was all that was required, you know, so he had the required education of his time. Oh, and he can't understand all these big words, and so be simple with them. Yes, and I believe we should be simple and plain to understand, um, but there's also some words we just have to explain because they're right there in that. But then you also have people who are, you know, like Saul of Tarsus was well-educated, and so he could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those philosophers and all that kind of stuff, whereas the common fisherman probably could not, unless, of course, he's inspired by God, which, you know, J uh, John, John and James were and all that. But anyway... Um, but yeah, don't the educated people need the gospel too? Absolutely. And so, uh, and so we, God needs all of us. Uh, simple people that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with simple people, or you know, maybe not as less educated, I should say. And then very educated people like George Beals over there, who's not there tonight, but uh, that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, the, with the, you know, the guys that write Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, stuff like that, you know. Um, and so we need all those kind of people in the church and, um, and so that's good. Yes, Jesus was very simple, but Paul sometimes was complex, you know. Uh, and so, so far as teaching goes, both of them, because even what Paul said is the teachings of Jesus, right? Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 39, I think it is. If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord, right? And so... There, but anyway, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. All right, now this, this last hymn, we'll spend some time on it later, it is about the marriage of the Lamb, and again, that's a very significant contrast, yeah, and here's where it is, the, uh, the great prostitute who has no husband is dressed in flashy glitter, faces irreparable loss, she is left naked and burned, but the bride of the Lamb celebrates her marriage to her husband wearing fine linen and is bright and clean. And then the church personified as the bride will never again have to listen to the pretending and deceit coming from the prostitute. And, uh, and again, that's again limited to the, the persecuting forces that John is riding up against. All right, um, appreciate your attention tonight. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious God and loving Father, we thank you so much for this time we've had to study your word, and we pray that through this we'll understand your will better, we'll understand your nature better and our nature better, that we can put your word to practice and be more pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amém. Good evening. That was loud. Wow. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and mark the invitation song, it'll be number 103. 103, we'll use that as an invitation song here in a few minutes. A couple of announcements. Number one, we're just glad everybody is here with us this evening. Those that may be visiting, definitely you are considered an honored guest, and we're happy to have you, and hopefully you'll be able to come again. Just want to continue to remember Fran Gabaldon and Stacy Wilson and Bill Long. Fran Gabaldon, she'll be having surgery here in a few weeks. Stacy Wilson is at home, still needs our prayers. And Bill Long is in the hospital with blood clots. Also, Jim Turner, he's in the hospital in Hudson with some respiratory problems. Want to remember him. And Patty Van Ellen has a broken wrist now. So want to remember her and the family and as she deals with that. The elders would like to meet with each family here from the congregation. They'll be meeting at the building on the third Sunday of the month. Please let them know what time and what date works best for you. If you do have a family member graduating this year, please get their photo and information to the office as soon as possible. So we can get that in the bulletin. Also, we will be celebrating our high school graduates with a reception following an evening service on April the 28th. Team four will be in charge of the kitchen. Laura Street Church of Christ gospel meeting will be April 26th through the 28th. Rico Brown will be the speaker. There's a four-year for that. Um, in the hallway there, along with some others. There'll be a Church of Christ homeschool educator retreat at Orange Street on April 26th and 7th. Please register. Uh, let's do it. Eagle Lake will be having a Ladies' Day on April the 20th with Pamela Clark and a gospel meeting beginning the next day on the 21st with Jimmy Clark. Griffin Road Church of Christ annual lectureship is Saturday, April 27th. Rick Canyon will be one of the speakers, and it does begin at 9. I believe it was like 9 to 12.30 or something other like that. So lunch will be provided. Be Real is the youth retreat at Wikiwachi for ages 13 through 18, and it'll be May the 3rd through the 5th. You need to register by today if you want to receive a T-shirt. It's hosted by the Orange Street Church of Christ. Contact Chad Tagto or the office if you are interested in going. Um, that is all the announcements. That, nope. Men's breakfast for April will be on the 20th. That's this Saturday at the Golden Corral in Winter Haven, and that will be at 9 a.m. So that is this Saturday. That is all the announcements we have. If there are any additional announcements, if you get those to one of the elders or the office, we'll get those made just as soon as we can. Thank you. Good evening. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give, give me at that day, 
not only to me, but to unto them that love his appearing. The question of the evening is, are we ready? The fragility of life is something that always has been something that always weighs heavy on my mind, as I'm sure has weighed on your minds at times as well. Life can end so easily with diseases as we've we've um, has become so real to us in the past few weeks with our dear brother Kevin and Sherry Patterson and the disease that she's dealing with. Accidents happen where life is lost. People take other people's lives. But death always becomes more real to us when it, when it hits closer to home. About a week and a half, two weeks and a half ago, um, I lost a friend close to me. Um, he died in an accident, and this caused me to, to think, have some, have some questions for myself. Of course, you know, we don't ever question God because we know that these things happen for a reason. Everything happens for a reason, and most of the time these things aren't because God allowed them or caused them to happen. It's just because of, you know, free will that he gives us. But I did question myself and ask myself, did I do enough? I asked myself, did I set the best example for him? I asked myself, did, did I say the right things? And he didn't come to, to service with me, even though I asked him, even though I, you know, asked him on multiple occasions. He made those decisions himself, but those questions always, you know, are apparent in my mind. Then I started questioning myself, am I living like I should? Am I like Paul, am I ready to die? One of the most unsettling things about death is that nobody knows, from the oldest person to the youngest person in here, nobody knows who's going first, who's going last. That's one of the most unsettling things about death to me. But like Paul was sure of his death that he was going to receive a crown of righteousness, can we be sure of that same thing? How do we know that Paul was sure? One, because he says it, of course, in these verses. But two, we see how he lived his life. Throughout First and Second Timothy, we see Paul giving Timothy good spiritual living advice. So many key verses that we pull from First and Second Timothy. You know, we can go all throughout this this book, those two books, and see Paul telling Timothy how he ought to behave as a Christian. So first, we have to live our lives according to how God wants us to live spiritually. We have to align ourselves with God, live like Christ. Paul tells us to imitate him as he imitates Christ. So in order for us to be sure of receiving that crown, we have to live our lives like we should. And the second, second way we should, in order to know that we are going to receive a crown is we have to share God's word with others. Preacher James Eves, he, he um, taught on the lesson. I knew him back in Louisiana. Um, he taught, um, excuse me, he taught on the um, lectureship, but I knew him from back in Louisiana. And one thing that he said was, the number one goal in life should be to get to heaven. And the number two goal is to, to bring someone with you. That always resonated with me because we can't only think about ourselves we have to think about others as well. We have to get ourselves aligned with God first. Once we're aligned with God, we have to help others get that way as well. The beginning of the chapter, um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, where I just read, verse 2, tell, uh, Paul tells Timothy to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. So all throughout 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, Paul is talking to Timothy about how he should live and in this last verse, in this last chapter, he writes to Timothy, he tells him that he should be worried about others by preaching the word to others. So these are the two ways that Paul knew that his life was aligned with, with Christ, and that he was going to receive a crown. And we can do the same if we live our lives, align our lives with God, with God and with Christ, and we also teach others about him. So at this time, if you have any need, if your life is not aligned with God, 
and make that request known as we stand and sing. out this morning. Thank you for this beauty you have given us. And I ask that you be with us as we depart from here, that we will take the lesson and use it in our daily lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 